Hello and welcome to the Cube Pod episode 59. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, our weekly pod. Took a week off. We were so traveling. We actually ran reruns of the Cube. Hey, Dave, good to see you. We're back hey, John. On our, back at our desk. Been traveling. Missed you last week, but it well, sounds like you had a great week. Yeah, I had two kids graduating back to back weeks from college. That was took a lot. And plus the events, we had Red Hat Summit, we had RSA, we had um, Boomi World. Next week, we got Dell Tech World, IBM Think. A zillion events, Informatica, Informatica. World, just uh, tons of events going on. But, um, you know, just, just Dave, just a big, this is a monster week. Okay. This has been a crazy week. It's AI wars. That's going to be, I already know the title of this podcast. Cause let's say like, you got Amazon web service has got a new CEO. Adam Selevsky is out. Um, and the new guy in Matt Garman. And, uh, we got a lot to talk about there. Certainly we'll come back to that. Dig into it as our first segment. Yeah. Open Not really AI. new, but yeah, we, everybody knows Matt. We'll come in and dig that in the top top of the segment. OpenAI ran a demo event of their version of their multimodal version of four. Um, and then that was on the heels of the front end of Google I.O., which is a monster event for Google. That's their consumer show, Gemini, and, and over 100 announcements. Um, there's reports that OpenAI was crawling YouTube. Sindar um, responded with corporate speak. We'll dig into the implications of that. Intel has a new leader for their fab plant and just a lot of financings going on. You got core weave raised 7.5 billion in debt financing. We covered them at supercomputing just more and more um, European union regulations, a lot of enterprise action heating up. Uh, we're expecting to see the large enterprise shows in year two of the AI wave. What will be on the bone Dave? Will it be meat? We will discuss that in great detail over the next few weeks. Yeah. So like you said, a lot going on. Um, I think the Adam news was was a surprise to me. I saw the it's still like an angle that was like 15 analysts chiming in, uh, giving their opinions. Some <laughs> yeah. said it wasn't a big surprise. I, I'll I, I want you to start off. I mean, you know yeah. Amazon better than anybody. Uh, what's your take? Well, I did not. I did not have this on my bingo card. In fact, I was uh, texting back and forth with some of the other reporters from the Information, New York Times, and other other outlets, because um, apparently we had the story, and they know that they read my LinkedIn post. So if you go to my LinkedIn post, you'll see pretty much the scoop, um, and that scoop that that is just obvious to us because we've been covering it. Nobody from Amazon reached out to anyone. This happened literally really fast. Um, I don't know what happened, but here's what I think did happen. I think Andy Jassy hired Adam Selesky three years ago. He had a ton of internal people lined up for the CEO job. Charlie Bell, Matt Garman, Teresa Carlson, um, you know, all kinds of other leaders. You had, what's his name from, um, who ran sales, uh, Mike Clayville, um, and a bunch of other folks lined up for the heir apparent for Andy's job. They're Amazonians. They're, they're OGs. They've been there from the beginning. And uh, what happened was, is that I don't think Matt was ready because he's young. He was only an intern in two th early 2000s at Amazon. So, and he's a, he's a, he's got two degrees, got a master's degree in computer science. He ran the core product AC2 uh, and the core elastic um, com uh, storage. So he's a, he's a, he's one of the core originals. One of Jassy's lieutenant, top lieutenants on the S team. And I think at that time, Dave, if you remember, go back three years ago, Jeff retired because he had those little scandals and then he was kind of checked out doing Blue Origin. And he got tapped to run the company because he's the best choice and he's a great leader and he's smart. So who does he pick? He's got to pick someone who he knows. Adam came out of Tableau. They sold to Salesforce. He dropped in to be the CEO. And that's on paper, that was a good move. Now, if you remember what happened after that, a bunch of people left. Teresa Carlson, Mike Clayville, a lot of the, the early leaders that were on that original Jassy team left. Mary Camerata, Rishi ran comms, all these people left. They're all the original uh, DNA. Adam had to rebuild the team. The good news is he's an old school Amazonian, so he knew the ship. He knew the ship. He could run it. Right. Just don't hit any icebergs. Now, he was sailing in the North Atlantic, turns out, because there were icebergs everywhere. It's called AI. And what happened was um, the world just turned on. The pandemic, in the middle of the pandemic, Amazon was expanding super fast. They were um, deploying a ton of revenue with the from call centers, just growth. And the zero interest rate kicked in. They had then the cost cutting, all that was going on. So, so the Adam managed that well. Adam really didn't do anything wrong. So what happened was the AI came. The AI wave hit it and, I, and he just missed it. I think this was a case where Adam was overwhelmed and the team was overwhelmed by the fact that they could not move fast enough to meet the AI wave in the eye of public opinion. 
this is a classic case. And they had their stuff, but they just were exposed. They just could not put the clothes on fast enough. They couldn't put the AI suit on. Microsoft did it faster. That bumped up their Azure sales and perceptions on their office suite, their cloud. I mean, Azure just didn't get that much better. If you think about it, they had open AI, they got office, but they started taking share. So more competition and the AI, and it was just, it's, it's wartime. So as I wrote in my LinkedIn post to quote the Godfather, he's a Tom Hagen of, of, uh, of, of Amazon. So he's not a wartime conciliary. And that scene with the Godfather where, you know, Mike says, you're out, Tom. And then you're not a wartime conciliary. We're going to make these moves and that, and we need to have a wartime conciliary. And that that's really what it was. And the Don was jassy, probably like, look at Adam, we got this. So I think Adam had to promote Matt quickly because he's got product chops, Dave. I've interviewed him many times. I've had multiple one-on-ones with him. The guy is solid. He's good. He's aggressive. He might be a little bit rough around the edges. People, people were commenting on my LinkedIn post about the lighting in his office. He's the kind of guy who just says, you want to do a Zoom, John? Great. Gets on Zoom. Doesn't care about the light. He delivers the payload and the content. That's the kind of leader he's going to be. Rough around the edges. He's an aggressive wartime leader, in my opinion. I'm putting that in my words. And so that's what happened. And who's the better choice? I mean, I think he he was running. He got uh, 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 brought in. And again, remember, Andy knows Adam really well because he was there from the beginning. Sales and on the sales and marketing side, certainly knew the products, but not at a root level like like uh, Matt did. And then I believe, and I'm going to report on this, but I, th- I believe this to be true. I believe Andy said to Adam, "Look it, go out and 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 build the team, figure out how to grow our team so that they can run at the pace that he built." And I think Matt was being groomed by Andy. And I've seen, I mean, Adam, I've seen Adam in person with in their headquarters i've heard him discussing and talking to matt about things like you get matt involved so they were very collaborative and adam Seleski and matt garman were collaborative and i think he was being groomed and matt garman left the product job handed over to, to dan brown dave brown and then he started running sales and marketing so that's what the grooming looks like go run the organization move from products and engineering to sales and marketing he ran all that he hired Matt Garman hired Regine Skillern from Intel, who we know very well. She'll be the CMO. She'll be on Matt's team. And Matt's going to put a team together. And we'll see. And he's got the Jassy uh, lieutenant status. He studied under the tutelage of Andy Jassy. So what will happen, in my opinion, next will be an aggressive turnaround on the AI product. I'm I'm going to predict that Matt Garman's going to turn the ship around. And if you remember, Dave. And we, I'm going to go back in the archive and find it. We discussed on the podcast early on and throughout all last year. We said it. They got to play offense. We've said it many times. They're playing defense. They got to play offense. At the end of the day, I think Adam was playing too much defense, not enough offense. And look at their announcements. It's been confusing, disjointed. They've been now they're getting. They've been much better over the past six months. I got to say, Matt Woods out in the field. So now it's time to crank it up. We'll see. It's it game on. It's wartime. We're going to see what's going to happen. So, uh, first of all, that was great analysis. I mean, <laughs> you just laid it out um, with some sort of inside knowledge. You know, I always liked the Adam appointment because he was a proven CEO. I think he did a great job at Tableau. Of course, a much smaller problem. But Tableau was had a real issue of of going from sort of an on-prem desktop tool to to really cloud. And, and Adam did yeah. that. And they had a yeah. really successful exit. I felt like, you know, the his first reinvent I thought was 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 a little tough, but you're following Jesse's footsteps. But <laughs> I thought he did I thought he did a really good job last year. I I I've always really liked his one-on-ones with you. You know, you you record those. I, I think he does very yeah. well in that setting. I remember before the, the first one you did before Chat GPT was announced, the second one you did actually, um, he mentioned LLMs. Uh, yeah. And so obviously it was on their radar. Uh, and, and of course he, he presumably helped orchestrate the anthropic investments. Although I know Jassy had his hand you know, deeply in that. Um, but do you yeah. feel, and, and of course he drove, I think the LLM optionality and, and I don't know, maybe he didn't move fast look at, enough. With I, look, at, look at, I look at this is, I mean, let me just be straight up straight up. The Adam Selesky did not fail. He was not asleep at the switch. He was on point. It was just, he just got dealt, the world just spun onto his doorstep in a completely different, he got a tsunami in, in, on his doorstep. He had the pandemic and the AI war wave hit, okay? And 
he was running a machinery <laughs> at that time. It was like, you know, just don't don't hit an iceberg. You know, just just under chassis, get it together. Remember, cost cutting was at the time going on post pandemic. Even chassis was cutting back on the Amazon fulfillment side. They overspent there, so Amazon was like a big battle, big aircraft carrier. Dave, it's hard to move that aircraft carrier and be nimble. He did a great job, and I had multiple one on ones with him. He was. He was fluent. He understood the strategy. It was just hard to move the machinery, the, the aircraft carrier of Amazon really fast because you had a team turnover at the top and you were multi years into a um, sales and marketing competitive battle with Microsoft and they were retooling and they were growing, still growing, by the way. Look at the number. The scoreboard was that doesn't lie. So, you know, for the people who are taking cheap shots at Adams, you know, oh, he didn't do a good job with AI. He did not do a bad job. It just was a classic case of the Godfather. It's time for a wartime conciliary. And I think Matt Garman got the nod. So Jassy made a good call. And I think Selevsky should be commended. I got to say, every single meeting I was in, he was on point. You know, he did, he was kind of like, you know, I think more sales and marketing, not a product led CEO. He was customer led. They need a product led CEO. I think Garmin brings that to the table. He has product chops. He understands the technology. And, you know, he's just got to pull that AI together and just go to go to war. He's got multiple fronts, Google, Microsoft, Oracle. I mean, everyone, there's more competitive market out there and customers are comfortable with going to the clouds now. So you're seeing, you're seeing multi-cloud take off. So it's not the one cloud takes all anymore. Well, but so Amazon, you know, Amazon Titan, is not considered, you know, the, the leading edge foundation model. They put it out there. Olympus is supposedly the one that they're working on. They're investing, they're committing up to $4 billion on Anthropic. Do you think that was a miss? In other words, could they have spent, I don't know how much of that 4 billion is sort of counted as, well, we're going to give them a dollar and then they're going to buy a dollar of infrastructure. So there's some of that, but there's still multiple billions that they're putting into Anthropic. I don't, that, I don't think, I don't think well, they hold have on. Well, let me just finish. That they, they, you know, the, the, the premise here is: could they have better anticipated uh, uh, the LLM trend, like Google, Google clearly has, even though they've had some stumbling blocks, because they know their their AI. They have Amazon has AI chops. Could they have earlier on invested more in Olympus and been more competitive with foundation models? And maybe that's. But I don't see how that's on Adam. You know, to me, that's on the technical team. Um, and the visionaries, technical visionaries in the in the company. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? You know, I have a lot of thoughts on that. It's, it's a tough question. I mean, ultimately, the CEO is responsible. So, you, you know, like I said in my LinkedIn post, at the end of the day, it does fall on Adam. And I think the Andy Jassy of the world look at that situation and say, you know, he probably made a ton of money on it. Anyway, he was already rich from the early days of Amazon. But it's on him. He, You know, if you look at Satya Nutella, who was technical, he technical leaders, product-led technical leaders have a vision of where to connect the dots. Steve Jobs had it as a product person. He's a product-led CEO. I think if if you can say Amazon Web Services missed anything, it was connecting the dots with the really what the inflection point of AI was. They saw it. I just think they underestimated what it could be because they were the number one cloud. So it's a classic case of complacency. Warren Buffett talks about this all the time. What kills companies is complacency. And I think I'm not saying Amazon was complacent. I just think that they underestimated the power of what this could be. So if you miss the open AI opportunity at that time that go back a few years, then you're missing out on nothing. There's nothing else on the table. There's no, there's no one else. Anthropic was a spin out of uh, open AI and all the other companies were essentially alumni for open AI. It's like shit gravy train. I'm going to jump on this bandwagon. And then, and then the rest is history. So after open AI did the deal with Microsoft, there was no bribe for, AWS, but so so but, of course. And by the way, Anthropic just raised a ton of money, so they're playing uh, arms dealer mode. They were basically arms dealer in multiple clouds. So you know, even today, I think Amazon's trying, trying to buy uh, Anthropic. But you know, that's what some people are reporting makes sense. But the dollars to do that are so high. What's the valuation of Anthropic right now? I forget. It's like in the billions and billions. So it's like, is it worth it? Yeah, I so, think it's over twenty billion now, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's too late. The move that my AWS missed picking up open AI because once Microsoft got that, the lead was so insurmountable at that time. And just now Anthropic's just catching up and some will say they're not caught up. I, so, I don't think they are, but so this is my point though, John is, is, is Solipsky came in in what? 2021, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, the time 
to 2020. compete. 2020, okay. He was became CEO in 2020. Okay. Mm -hmm. The time to compete in LLMs really was 2016, 2017, 2018. That's when you should have been pouring billions into large language models. So, I don't know, Solipsky, he was, he was running Tableau at the time. So, I don't know, I'm not going to blame him for, the, for, for Amazon being behind in large language foundation models. Now, maybe to your point, you need a wartime consigliere translation. You need somebody who's more technical. Same thing with Snowflake, right? No, and, more aggressive, and, and more aggressive on the product side. This is a classic case of the Wayne Gretzky quote that everyone quotes. But, Skate to where the puck's going. Okay, but hang on, hang on, hang on. I know you're excited, but hang on. Let me just, let me just <laughs> say, uh, there's part of its product chops. I, I, I acknowledge that, but there's also um, but a te technology, technological leader. Like I think Snowflake's board basically said, hey, we need to put Sridhar in, 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 in charge because we need a technical CEO. Now I heard also there was a rumor, total rumor that Microsoft was recruiting Sridhar. So that might've been played into as well. I don't know. I heard this secondhand. Um, and I, that's not the case here in this dynamic, but so you feel like, uh, Garmin is a wartime consigliere because a, he's got product chops, he's more technical and he's more aggressive. Correct. Am I summarizing it accurately? Yeah, and he, and he understands the original, uh, DNA of Amazon. They're trying to bring back that day one day day one DNA. You say Adam Trump, didn't though, but he was there from the beginning. No, yeah, well, of course. You think he yeah, lost well, it when he went to Salesforce? Well, no, no. I think he, I think he was, he was he had CEO chops over Garmin at that time, and I think he was hired. I, I, I haven't proven this, but I would bet the ranch this is true. But I think Jassy hired um, Selesky to, to groom Garmin or someone else. And I think Garmin was being groomed. And that's what grooming looks like. You send them across the organization, get understand how functions work, so you can get some savvy. Now, I think they elevated him faster because over the past month, um, you know, the whether it was the PR department or Adam's uh, move, but he was not doing the moves in the market. He was doing like these, uh, uh, he's did, you know, handshake kind of tours, you know, out there, you know, rah rah, you know, happy Earth Day, when the competition was all time high and. You got a huge competitive battle going on for biz dev and clients. So, you know, I think a, a wartime conciliary is not going to be doing the puffy PR stuff. They're going to be doing hardcore biz dev. They're going to be doing product engineering. They're going to work with the teams to put the best product in the market. It's a classic. I mistake. just, it's a I classic just feel like the timing. Companies make. If you I don't just have feel a like CEO at the helm that can handle the market, then it's 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 a mismatch. And I think that's all it was. And I think they just escalated Garmin to faster to the top. Yeah, he's well, good, he's and he's a good he's a good choice. He's hardcore, and he doesn't put up with any BS. Um, from what I have, yeah, people internally say that you know Matt Garman is is um, hard charging, and that he doesn't put up, he doesn't suffer fools, and and you know, and you want to move fast in wartime, you got to move fast. I mean, it had to be something like your your analysis is saying. We don't know for sure, but you know, because the timing is is right. I, you felt like AWS is really finally just shaping the story, you know, with Matt Wood on the road, you know, shaping the, the, the messaging, you know, the, op, the LLM optionality, we know Olympus is in the works, but this kind of signals that there was, you know, something wrong. And yeah, so that's why I, I mean, feel like it, the timing is, is, it's gonna, it's, is interesting. It, Dave, it's going to come down to the scoreboard right now. It's like, a, it's like, it's like, it's like a war. What's the body count? What's the, what's the customer count look like? You know, what are you winning or losing? There's clear benchmarks. Are you losing customers, gaining customers? Is your product winning or losing? It's going to be clear scoreboard opportunities from, from, for Microsoft and Amazon to compare. Now, Microsoft's got the advantage with open AI as they continue to thunder away at their lead. And ADS has got to make some bold moves. I mean, that's the, that's the line in the Godfather. You know, some people aren't going to like the moves we're going to make Tom and, you know, and we're going to make this Tom Hagen. And I think that's, what's going to happen. And again, we'll see, you got Swami, you got Matt Wood, Matt Wood's kind of the evangelist now, but he's doing a good job, but Swami's the lead. He'll probably put another, you know, tiger team together at Amazon to go put a product on out there. That's going to be compelling, leveraging the, all the benefits of AWS. They got to, because the perception was they're behind. Right. And that's, I, I think, I think the core catalyst to this. I, I do feel as though um, in some regards that you can compete with Microsoft. Microsoft is Microsoft. They're going to be everywhere. They're making some great moves, but they're Microsoft, you know, they got their software estate and it is what it is. And it's, and it's awesome at the same time, it's not, you know, it's like <laughs> my concern, if I were Amazon would be Google. 
and the data suggests this, the data shows that Google's AI is, is, is rapidly catching up, their AI momentum rapidly catching up with that of AWS. And AWS was, you know, it was all about uh, machine learning with SageMaker. And of course, it's hard to tell from the data that I have how much of, you know, Anthropic and Mistral and some of these other models as part of Bedrock are actually going through uh, AWS. I don't have that survey data. We're trying to get that. Uh, but you can very clearly see Google's momentum right on top of, of Amazon. And that would be a concern to me that Google, because AI is so important and Google's got such strong AI chops, as you saw at Google Next and we're seeing this week at, at Google I.O., that would be a big concern because Amazon has the best cloud. If all of a sudden Google has the best AI cloud, that's that would be a big, you know, from a technology standpoint, that would be a big concern and talk speaks to why you would want someone like Matt Garman in charge. I mean, the, 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 it's an AI war, Dave, and, and there's so much going on. Look at stability AI, they're calling it unstability AI. They look in the cell, they did the um, fusion, this fusion model. Um, in this information has an article that's trying to raise some money from 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 uh, investors so they don't get sold off under cash crunch. Um, you know they're the AI image generator company. First of many, brother. Okay. First and, of many. And you got that back. You got you got you got the Google. Uh, you know the the Open AI announcement was um, they did a live stream demo day. They they, they did it as a demo. Um, uh, GPT um, four O they call it. It's a multimodal thing. Very impressive. You know, communicate with voice in real time. It just goes to show you what's coming. They did that on the the, the doorstep of Google I/O to try to preempt Google, and Google had a great hundred a hundred announcements, over a hundred announcements. Um, and so Google brought out the goods, Dave. Like as we've been reporting, that they're, they're roaring back. Uh, did you and, see? I mean, AI is still pushing the envelope. Did, yeah. did, did you see the Astra demo? They basically. It, it's, the way it was described was that these multimodal models are generally, you got you got, you got a text model, you have a, a video model, you have an audio model, and the, the models can call on each of those. But what the way Astro was described is it was built from the ground up to be multimodal, and it basically can sense things. We got humans have senses, five senses, and it can tell you where you left your keys, where you left your glasses, you can point it at something and say, "Tell me what this is." Yeah. Uh, uh, tell me what what this is specifically, and it gives you like really good details. Um, you know what? It, it point the demo. I think I saw this on sort of Jeet's feed. The demo points at a speaker. It says, "What's this?" And says, "Oh, that's a speaker." And then they then they point. They draw a line to the to the tweeter. What is this? That's the tweeter, and it does the high end. You know, the tinny sounds, and then yeah. that's the woofer. I mean, really amazing. And then where did I leave my glasses? Oh, you left them on the table over there. I mean, this is really scary shit, but but it's quite amazing and remarkable demo. Yeah, and, and remember, it was just a demo. OpenAI was more than a demo, it was actually code. So a lot of commentary online around Google doing a demo, not so much raw code as in, in OpenAI had a better demo. <laughs> it was a demo because there tends to be the demos that, that are yeah. canned demos. So to me, you know, canned a canned demo. It's quote old school term. Put it in a can. It's basically engineered for the demo. That's just to show you the capabilities. OpenAI did a live demo. That was different. So um, again, parsing through that, that's a really big deal. So again, yeah. it shows the lead on OpenAI. But Google's coming back again. We said this at Google Next a year ago, and then this past Google Next, eight months later, Google could really roll up that next generation developer. And I think that's why, again, back to not to go back to Amazon, but for a quick point, that's why Amazon has to win back this next generation. And I think that's a smart move of them. But again, look at the changes, Dave. The scale is getting bigger. Remember, we had the debate about is OpenAI going to be a one trick pony? Will it catch up? How much to build the LLM? Well, you're going to hear uh, companies in, in, in this circuit, we're going to go down the next few events coming out with their own LLMs. Open source is LLMs are coming out. The Llama 3 is strong. So the question is, What's the differentiation around open AI? And I think it's just scale, scale and capabilities. Um, and speed and, and speed of innovation. I mean, they are impressive, I gotta say. Have you played around with um with with Omni, GPT Omni? I have not GPT 4.0. I have a little bit. In fact, I was trying to do it today. So um, you know, we have a new analyst. Uh, I don't know, maybe we're not announcing that until next week, but I was putting together a deck 
And you know how we have our analyst deck has circles with our pictures. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the new analyst, I could only get a, a, a headshot that was a square. So I asked uh, OpenAI GPT uh, Omni for Omni to put this square into the circle. And it kept fumbling, but I went to Meta AI and it, and it did it beautifully. So I was like, huh, now that's just one crappy little use case, but you know, Llama 3 is looking good. I tell you, I like I like how it's got the multimodal capabilities. You can ask it to code. You can ask it to change images around. Um, that was one. I, I just think overall, you're going to start to see competition heat up. It's going to be a fight for the consumer. And I talked to, uh, with a, a company today. I did a, a talk this morning um, with the company's t uh, team of 40 people at a company who talked about a half hour coffee talk. And their enterprise. And I said, the consumer side of the business is where all the action is. Google, Amazon. And that's where Broadcom and the NVIDIA's world is supplying all their chips, the hyperscalers. But it's the enterprise, Dave, and the power law of these models is where the action is for the enterprise. So what's interesting that's happening now is, and this is different than the web. We always compare this wave to the web wave. In the web wave, the, the enterprise lagged the consumer by years. I mean, it's five, maybe five years or more. Whatever happened to the consumer happened in the enterprise five years or more later. Not here, not in AI. The, the lag is months, okay, in, in consumer to enterprise. However, the interesting thing is, is that the data in the enterprise side is actually well positioned for AI to be more reliable. And what I mean by that is, is that the hallucinations we see on the large language foundation models are, are there because the, the corpus is so big, the data sets are so big. When you start getting into the specialty models and these enterprises, they're tightly coupled, they data sets, they're, 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 um, it's good data. It's their data. It's proprietary to the company. So I think you're going to see a lot more um, new ways to wrangle that data for AI. And I think you're going to see uh, a lot more smaller hits in the enterprise. To use the baseball metaphor, get a, get on base, get a single, don't swing for the fences. So for startups out there that are succeeding in the enterprise and for projects that are succeeding in the enterprise, it's small ball. They get, they get on base, they hit a single, they hit a double. On the consumer side, you have to hit a home run to win. And so you're going to see the stability AIs of the world start to get cash crunches and start to get sold off or, or acquired. And then the clear winners are the home run hitters. And then the enterprise, it's small ball. And you're going to see that look like in the long tail of the power law. So let's debate that a little bit because I, and I'm not sure you're, you're, you're countering this, but I would say, tell me if you agree, that consumer still leads the innovation. Right, you would agree with that, and yes. it and it and it defines the economics uh, because they have volume. Now, as as far as data goes, I, I think OpenAI's got really good data. The the argument that I made in January 2023 with you and Sarbjeet, Sarbjeet and I were on the, I think potentially the wrong side of history here, saying that OpenAI won't be able to sustain its 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 first mover advantage. So far, it is, and. And your argument was was pretty strong, and and one of them was they they're going to get all the data early on, and that's exactly what's happened. They get more data than anybody, and they seem to be ahead. And by the way, just as an aside, I just texted. I know you did a little talk on AI today, and I texted. I know the the folks that you gave that to. I said, you know, how'd it go with John today? Furrier was great. The team loved it. Thanks for hooking me up. So nice job. Oh, good. So, I never was over there. What were you? What were you talking about? What were you, uh, it was AI, right? It was well, an I was, AI I, talk, I, right? I was giving my, I was giving a little test drive of my AI trends, the big platform shift. And basically the premise was, is that the, there's an, a, the AI revolutions here and that the enterprise actually is going to have more um, hits than, than the consumer in the sense of it's a long tail of hits. So for example, if every, if, if you believe that, um, if you believe that the infrastructure is going through a, a changeover because of generative AI, because it's generating, uh, and this is what Jensen Wong said in his keynote many times, and as well as the Broadcom Financial Analyst Meeting with Charlie Kawaz and his team, Michael Dell is going to say it in his event. We we're going to hear from Gelsinger. We're going to hear from every single company. It's a revolution. It's a platform shift. And I basically said as context, when you have platform shifts this significant, like the web, there's a, a mark in time where you say there's an old way and a new way and everything at that mark is changed. Everything is old or new. And you can almost look at it clearly like that. 
I, we always say in the podcast here, which side of the street are you going to be on? The winning side or the losing side? Or in this case, the new side or the old side? And so what's happening is the lines are being drawn, Dave. And the lines are being snapped out in the marketplace. And you can see clearly that last year and this year will determine old and new. And everything will be on one side or the other. And it'll be very clear when the fog lifts, you're going to see that. And that is tokens, okay? Uh, the computational revolution around transformation of compute and high-performance computing becoming to the application layer. You're starting to see that retrieval-based uh, computing models. Dynamic, real-time content creation tailored to applications. So this computation is going to impact all the things that used to be slow. Content creation, application development, observability, managing services inside the application. All that is going to get better and faster and cheaper. And then you're going to have human interaction with supercomputers, or in this case, robots. So, you know, direct interaction with AI-driven experiences around supercomputing is going to be commonplace. I mean, I mean, two years ago, we were at supercomputing. It was a total nerd show, but NVIDIA was recruiting like crazy. Amazon was there. That's going to revolutionize user experiences and back-end processes. And finally, AI is a learning system. You know, you got training, inference is the big conversation today, reasoning and learning and reinforced learning. That's where the action is going to be. That's understanding diverse data sets. That's where ChatGPT 4.0 comes in. You start to see that multimodal learning. And then finally, the laws of physics and AI simulation, digital twins, advanced simulation platforms, decision-making grounded in reality and 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 thinking about things like safety and then finally just robotics ai integrating to enterprise apps so all these things are happening that means that the infrastructure is changing and that's why amazon's putting out more silicon that's why broadcom's doing well that's why dell stock is up because they're they they're coming out with this ai pc server brilliant positioning just it's just enough more more gear more more compute um so oh. just more stuff. I mean, so You're all right. that all that's coming in, that means the data, the data model is going to change. So if you have an install base, I mean, that's a boomy event uh, then. If you have an install base of customers and you're managing their data and platforms, if you're a supplier, you're in a position to easily have a step function advancement in customer support. So it, a cold start enterprise company, it'll be hard for a startup to do a cold start and take territory in the enterprise AI market. It has to come from an incumbent vendor and because they have the data. The scale matters. And I think that's what we learned from the wave with Amazon and the hyperscalers. If you're an enterprise supplier, even if you're in a niche market, if you have scale, that's your that's your moat. That's but the barrier mean, to entry. The, the point you're making about once, once the race starts, everything changes. And you certainly saw that with PCs. Mm -hmm. You had PCs, you had PC channels, you had PC printers, you had PC networks. Same thing with the web. You had web portals, you had websites, you had web commerce. You said same thing with cloud. You had <laughs> cloud apps, cloud native, cloud storage, mobile apps, mobile phones, mobile devices. And you can, you're seeing it with AI as well. And and I, you mentioned Dell. Yeah. So with my breaking analysis, I was sort of doing a hybrid AI, um, you know, putting Dell and IBM in focus because we're going to be at Think and um, and Dell Tech World. Dell now trades. Dell used to trade at about 20 to 25 cents on the revenue dollar, its valuation. It was really getting a, a quarter for every dollar of revenue in, 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 in valuation terms. Huge company, but it wasn't, was way undervalued. Dell now is worth more than $100 billion on a 80, let's call it $85 billion revenue base. So it's trading at more than one X revenue, which of course, again, it was way undervalued. It's still got room yeah. to move. Um, and, and that's because two reasons. The big reason is because they're, they've got liquidity. Thank you, VMware, yeah. for the, the, the restructuring and being our mm -hmm. piggy bank for all those years, mm -hmm. <laughs> allowing us to go public um, yeah. when the time was right and restructure our balance sheet. Um, and, and so that liquidity allows them to, to, do share buybacks and dividends and, you know, investors love that, but they've also become a relevant AI company overnight. Thanks to the NVIDIA Dell AI factory and Jensen's proclamation at GTC. And people look at, at Dell, they're like, wow, it's, yeah. it's, it's not just NVIDIA and Broadcom. Uh, it's, it's also, and you know, some arm as well. It's expanding into companies like, like Dell. And I think, yeah. IBM and Cisco 
you know, can also take advantage of this. Cisco's troubles, you know, notwithstanding of the beat last quarter had a really nice, nice beat. Um, although it's, it's yeah. <laughs> I think it was sandbagging, you know, uh, uh, to a great extent, but still they figured it out. Um, but there are these companies, these big whales are going to benefit from AI. And we've talked about yeah. this a lot on previous cube pods and Dell is kicking ass. Their stock price has doubled more than doubled in the past 12 months. Well, I'm doing a big, um, big thing on clustered systems. We've been talking about this a lot in our events we go to. Yeah. Um, and Dell's just, Dell just takes advantage of the refresh cycle that's coming. And this is something that's not really talked about. Maybe you can get into it and you have some, I know you've talked about it before. We've talked about it off camera and a little bit on the cube. And I know Intel's got this new fab person coming on board. We'll get to that in a second. But if you think about what's going on with the, with, with AI enablement is that it's a slingshot back to the old school data center model. But it's not it's not yesterday's data center. It's a whole nother compute architecture. And we've we've kind of teased on this in the past, but the packaging of the compute layer, servers, you think about a PC, we all know a laptop has a processor, and RAM, and SSD and a disk and a bus and I.O. And it servers the same way. And you put a bunch of servers on a rack and a data center, you put power, a switch, old school rack and stack gear. Those days are now about how many servers can you put into a configuration? How many processors can you put on a board with internet, ethernet in the substrate and all these connectors highly engineered for throughput? And that is basically supercomputing architecture. So the old server, which Dell and HPE are known for, remember those days, this client server? Now the server is essentially like the power of a data center. So you're seeing these, these systems bundled together in clusters, connected through all kinds of other interconnects. That's why Broadcom stock is killing it right now because their chip business is booming. It's not so much their software business. They got a lift with, they got a gift with VMware thanks to Michael Dell, but Broadcom software business is a bunch of old cobbled together M&A deals. So maybe VMware can unify that, but the chip, the chip team, Charlie Coaz, Jazz Tremblay, and those guys over there, they're killing it because they're they're dominating the chip business because they they skated to where the puck's going. And that is all the processors need to connect with little things, little chips. So think big chips and little chips integrated together. I'm oversimplifying it, but that's the new motherboard. Is the Dell's and Dell's that's Dell's core competency. I mean, they don't want to say we're a hardware company, but they're kind of a hardware company. Well, they're they are a software. hardware company. Yeah, they yeah, are a hardware. Amazon's <laughs> a hardware company, for crying out loud. I mean, let's face it. Right? But it's it infrastructure. It's, it's all software. Idiots. At the end of the day, software runs on something, as, as yeah. uh, Oracle used to say, right? Larry Ellison. But Dell will get a lift on this because with AI and coming out of cloud 1.0 wave, enterprises are smart. They can say, I have a workload an application that powers maybe, let's take a bank, let's take a, a Capital One or a Citibank or someone like that, a Wells Fargo. They got a mobile app. It powers hundreds of thousands, millions of people using it. They know exactly what it does and they upload software to it that has, it has features. They can now go end to end and benchmark that, Dave, and create a dedicated infrastructure just to support that in a way with AI. So they can actually pre-identify that and load up a, a hybrid architecture to serve that workload. And when they inject AI into the architecture, the, it changes the game of the app. What's going to happen is the app's going to get smarter. So that's why on the Wall Street Journal front page, I know you had your Wall Street Journal in front of you, but look at the front page. You know it. What's the top story? Core Weave raises $7.5 billion in debt for AI computing push. That company exists because the phenomenon we're talking about happening. Clients are saying, I got cloud, no problem, but I got a workload. And, and when I need processing, I need performance, I can throw the workload at a compute farm or a, a, at a specialized set of resource. That is game changing. That's what the era we're going into. AI could say, hey, I'm doing some cool things with the application. Wow, I need to think and do some real reasoning. That's going to require a whole nother policy of performance. Okay, I'm going to go away and think about it. We say that in person. Hey, Dave, let me take a minute to think about that and get an answer back to you. That's okay. You go to some compute farm, like a core weave, and you're done. And you come back. That is awesome. That didn't exist five years ago. That's what supercomputing is bringing to the table with AI. So again, this is changing the game in every single category, old way and, and new way. So the old that, way is going to be like, oh, yeah. 
I did that in 2005. Oh, we used to do that in 2018. Not in anymore. That, in that core, we was debt financing, right? So it's not equity. It's they're mm -hmm. paying interest on that. And then Intel, Intel, it's, there's a, a story in the journal about, I, I missed this until today, that nearing a deal with Apollo to get uh, access to 11 billion for a new plant in Ireland. So, so people are taking on debt to do these things, um, which is interesting at, at whatever, 5% or higher interest rates. It's one thing to be at zero interest rates. And interest rates still aren't that high, historically speaking. They were much higher during the dot-com. They were like 7 8%. But, um, and then, so that was interesting that it's debt financing. But then there's other, I don't know if you mentioned this already, Vercel, Sigma, Harness, Weka, Alkira, they all raised $100 million plus rounds. Yeah. Yeah. Like, holy cow, the money is just blowing. Um, and and it all not all gonna hit, people. Not all gonna hit. So, and then Intel got a new um head of foundry. You saw that obviously. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. What's your take on that? Because you follow Intel very closely. Um, the fab business is gonna be a big opportunity if they can if it can get ROI. What's your take on that? Is it a throw are they throwing a Hail Mary here? Or is it well, so this this gentleman o buckley has got ibm chops and global foundries replacing stuart penn you know the more i get into it the more the more balls i think pat gelsinger has so i think you know he knows what he's getting into i mean intel is they are really throwing i, I guess a sort of a hail mary what they're trying to do is almost a miracle and never really been done before so they're doing they're bringing in innovations. They're trying to, you know, historically, TSM was the one who would like push the envelope and Intel was very conservative because they were the leader and it's almost like the reverse now. So Intel's trying to do gate all around innovations, which is really you wrap the gate around all four sides of the channel. Intel calls it ribbon FET. They're doing that. Um, and remember, Intel introduced FinFET to the industry back in 2011, but then TF TSM took it and, and innovated. They did all the innovation and R&D on top of it. So they're doing gate all around. They're doing backside power, right? Historically, you put all the, everything goes on the top side of the wafer. Well, what Intel is doing, they call it power via, and TSM's doing it as well. They're putting the power delivery in the backside of the wafer. So what that does is it frees up a lot more room and it's way more power efficient. I guess it's like 30, 40% more power efficient and it makes the EDA software much more effective because you got more room now to, to lay down all the, all the stuff and all the channels in the silicon. And so they're doing both of those kind of at once and they're doing the new EUV machines from, uh, from ASML, the high NA, it stands for high numerical aperture extreme, uh, EUV, which these, these machines cost like $400 million mm -hmm. and TSM wow. is not using them because they say the yields are too crappy. So my understanding is, and they're not doing that. Intel's not doing that till 14 a, which is, I think, I don't know, a couple down on the roadmap, but the point is they are pushing the envelope on so many different areas which normally you don't do that. Normally you introduce one of these innovations at a time. So this whole, you know, five nodes in four years, which is insane. You saw Gelsinger um, talking about Rembrandt's and, and, uh, and Michelangelo's in Silicon. He's so articulate. Um, but the, the, my understanding is these, these high NA UV machines are not only expensive, but they take longer to actually get um, wafers out. Like, I don't know, half, half the, you can only get half the wafers out in, in a day. So supposedly what Intel is doing is they're, la they're coming up with this new process, which has been in development for like a decade, where you lay down a polymer on the wafer and then you bake it for like an hour in an oven. And then it's like this self-forming, self-directing channels that laid lays down the channels and the wafer <laughs> organically. It's like, I don't know how it works. And then supposedly you can use these high NA EUV machines to guide it. Now this is like really risky that Intel's doing this, but if they pull this off, 
I mean, it's just, it's going to be a miracle if they pull this off. And so they're supposedly going to do all this, this high in a EUV in 14A by 2027. You know, God knows if they'll hit that target. But so does O'Buckley know what he's getting into? I He's, he's got to. Yeah. But they're really trying to leapfrog uh, what TSM is doing. I mean, God, John, if they pull it off, Gelsinger, this will be literally a miracle. Well, Pat could probably pull it off. He's got the Intel DNA from the beginning. Again, I, I think uh, Intel's got challenges. Um, and I think there's some opportunities that could flip their way. The whole nationalization of uh, chips could be one, but we talked about that in pot, two pods ago about, you know, Americans might not be you know, have the stomach to it to handle it. So we'll see about that. Uh, and then they have to, they be, have to be successful. I mean, I'm praying for Intel. I want to do that. I mean, the, the computing market, is so hot, like I, like we were saying about AI, everything's stuck at the infrastructure right now. If you look at all the AI hype, where the actual reality of stuff's happening, it's retrieval, okay? That's application-driven, that's data-oriented. Um, there's some compute in, involved, obviously, you know, training inferences and, and, and reinforced learning. So that's workable. The, the, whole, the hardcore stuff is waiting on the compute to get fixed. So if you look at Amazon, Microsoft, Oracle, NVIDIA, Broadcoms of the world, IBM, Google, they all got to, and, and the Dells and HPs, the hardware, they got to make better stuff because not that the stuff doesn't, isn't good enough now, but it's got to be good enough for the new wave, old way, new way. And I think when the infrastructure gets prime, that foundation gets set, I think you'll see the next layer of innovation be the data. Snowflake's announcing or about to announce an acquisition. They got their event coming up. Databricks has their event coming up. If you look at the data layer, I, I see AI in three layers, infrastructure, raw horsepower, chips, compute, servers, machines, all kinds of infrastructure. And then the next layer is data, all kinds of things around data. And then the, finally, the application software, the interface, the users. The data layer data is going to be completely upside down. I mean, how do you make an application on someone's device or edge of the network or somewhere do something generative in real time that's accurate? given this, the potential surface area of data a company may have about an experience. It's mind blowing technically what has to happen to make that happen. And I'll just tell you from our, from my, from, from what I'm looking at the market now, no one has anything. I mean, basically it costs money to move data. Okay. Right. E just egress fees. That's got to go away. Um, data lakes are good, but you got to pull stuff out of the data lake. You got to query it. Okay, what's the physics on that? Milliseconds, nanoseconds? If the data is available, do you co-locate the data? So again, all of this is up up in the air. I don't have an answer for you, but I can tell you right now that it, it you know it's a great conversation to have uh, at parties. You know, if you're into this stuff, hey, what's your, what's your semantic layer look like? Uh, yeah. yeah. So this is interesting. <laughs> this uh, Snowflake acquisition or rumored acquisition of um, of this company. Reka or Rika, I'm not familiar with them, but 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 um, it's there's a quote in here from Christian Kleinerman, basically saying this is the big opportunity is how we take some of these smaller, more customized models and bring them to run inside Snowflake. So we give customers the guarantee of using the model of privacy or data is guaranteed. So this is interesting. I mean, yeah, Snowflake billion dollars that they're going to spend on it. Yeah, Snowflake. Snowflake. That's rumor, yeah. by the way. Yeah. So Snowflake is a company that's in a major transition here. They they went from you know being this gold standard in in cloud data data warehousing to all of a sudden overnight the whole world is blowing apart with open table formats like iceberg where snowflake is now saying hey we're going to embrace that um and and we're going to make iceberg tables a first class citizen well if they do that then then it runs as well in 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 on, on iceberg as it does inside of snowflake then why do i bring all my data into, inside of snowflake so that's kind of interesting they 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 Lupin's out as ceo sridhar ramaswamy is in yeah. so hello they, New they're now going all in on the, he's going to put the fingerprints right? on the play doh right? they're know, all going me. all in on ai now and then yeah. they they just announced the uh, an arctic an llm to you know to be, to be a me too with dbrx even though you know, they have some advantages, supposedly. I don't know, but but Databricks, you know, seems they seem to be a follower in that front. So it's like, wow, this is a company in transition. And I, I'm really curious to see how Sridhar um, affects this transition 
they're betting the house on apps, AI apps now. Um, wow, even you were at Snowflake. We talked well, at Databricks last year. We talked about this a lot. They really changed the game with the Unity catalog, trying to create a new moat, you know, with uh, with with Unity and you know, Snowflake. We haven't heard anything about Unistore, which is their transaction um, engine. That was two years ago, and nobody's talking about that anymore. So really interesting times for Snowflake yeah, yeah. Um, and Databricks. Well, well, this is what I was saying to the uh, the talk I gave this morning. You know, you and I always say, what's after Snowflake and Databricks? We don't mean that in a way of saying they're over. What's after the data lake or the data reservoir, whatever you want to call it? And again, everyone who's building these data lakes are going to probably build off a connective tissue or a neural network or knowledge graph of some sort of data modeling. Yep. And what's going to happen is those are rivers, rivers of data. So, you know, for AI to hit, it's going to have to be restructured. I was talking with a, um, on email with Rachel Thornton. She's a CMO of Fivetran. She used to be the CMO of AWS. All right. She's amazing. Great executive, totally great experience. She's going to be at the Snowflake Summit and the Databricks Summit. So you're seeing a confluence, Dave, of, a, of an integration between the ecosystem. You have an intersection between Snowflake and Databricks. So um, this is something that we're going to watch very closely. We'll be at the Cube at Snowflake Summit and at Databricks, um, Data Plus AI Summit, um, uh, and we're going to look at that. The question is, there's a lot of ecosystem partners that play on both sides. Yeah. And is that a feature or a bug? I mean, I like. I mean, I think that's a feature of the of the market because with the, the open formats coming, you're going to start to see a lot more things happening, right? So five trans in there, um, DBT, Snowflake. So, you know, it's going to be a very multi-vendor data market. So again, once infrastructure gets shored up this year, next year, 2025 will be a major disruption of the data market. So this year yes. is a pre precursor, so, uh, precursor of that tsunami. <laughs> so what's interesting is we've been there since the beginning of the big data trend. You were literally, like literally, we were, you were inside uh, Cloudera's office when they started the big data trend in Hadoop. And what's happened is the the Hadoop ecosystem has has morphed into um, Databricks, Snowflake, obviously the cloud. The cloud got it started, and it's sort of dispersed. Yeah. And um, and these companies that you're mentioning, Fivetran, DBT, I'd throw an at scale in there. Guys like Calibra and Governance. There's all these ecosystem data ecosystem now exploding. And and what's forming is what we sometimes call the sixth data platform, meaning what's what's next? What's the next yeah. big thing beyond separating compute from storage? There's open table formats like Iceberg. There's transaction data that needs to be included. There's knowledge graphs from places, from companies like Relational AI that have to be included in that equation. And essentially the guy, the five trans and the DBTs have, have, have essentially api -ified the metrics inside the, these BI stacks. Um, so they can, you can, you can call them through APIs, but really they're just a metrics layer and they are trying to evolve into the next data platform. And, you know, you got guys like, like, like single store saying, Hey, we're there too. You know, they never really, you know, blew through and made like huge escape velocity, like yeah. a snowflake or a Databricks. Um, but you know, they've got to play on this and the couch bases and yeah. obviously Oracle's still a player. So there's, there's all this new formation, you know, this foam in the ocean right now, and it's going to reform <laughs> as, as something. And we're the looking for the, the data ocean, Dave, the data the ocean data ocean is back. Where's, where's Eric Herzog. So speaking of the six data platform, I was at, uh, um, with an NYSC this week, having an event, they had their tech event in San Francisco. Uday from Uber was there. Uday, uh, Medicetti, he was there. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, yeah. He cool was guy. up there. Saw him there. He runs, he's a distinguished engineer at Uber. He and I were talking about this whole unique app and they're still proud to be on the queue, by the way, they're super psyched. Their engineers were loving the cube action, but he, he and I were talking with some other, other founders, Lightspeed Ventures was there and a bunch of other folks were there. Nobody's talking about this. Okay. Nobody's talking about the massive disruption in how data platforms will not only be looking like architected and operating, but how they interact with each other. Right. So, you know, data has always been a stovepipe siloed kind of market. Yeah. They interact, some connectors happen there. Connectors have been around, but to make agents work, you got to have agents for connectors. 
Like that's why I like what Boomy's doing with right now. I love that went to that event. What Red Hat's doing, and again, companies like Boomy, Red Hat, IBM that have uh, Infor, others that have installed bases are going to have an opportunity. I was on, uh, and and it's, and it's, startups too. I mean, I was on with Justin Borgman yesterday. You remember Justin from yeah, Starburst. from Hadap days. Now he's at Starburst, and I like their play. They they have a a relationship with Dell. I mean, Dell's to me, Dell's data strategy right now, anyway, is really pivoting on top of or with Starburst, which I like. It's a data mesh play, so. Um, you know, try to democratize data. Don't don't put it all on the snowflake. You know, <laughs> use Starburst to to create a data mesh, and that's a really good play. You know, Snowflake would say, "Hey, put it all on the snowflake, and we're gonna you, we're the trusted, you know, blue blanket," uh, which is another good strategy. But it's the classic, John. It's the classic <laughs> classic proprietary value add versus open, and then the proprietary, just like we saw with VMware when Gelsinger was running it, had to get more open. Right, companies have to evolve, and that's what's happening with Snowflake. It's just fascinating to watch. Excellent management sees these trends and gets ahead of it. And and instead of fighting it, instead of fighting fashion, like Jeremy Burton always said, don't fight fashion, like they you know like like they used to back in the mini computer days. Yeah. Uh, these smart executives say, hey, you know we're not delusional. We have to lean in and transform. And it's that's what makes today's executives so much more capable than those of, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Like I said, um, what um, Warren Buffett has a famous quote of saying, it's complacency kills companies. Um, and um, right now, complacency is not recognizing generative AI because Jensen Wong nailed it as well as some of the other CEOs we've interviewed. It's generating, it's a new category. It's a net new thing. It's not static programmable web. It's dynamic real-time web. So you're starting to see a, that old way, the lines. And again, my big takeaway going into this next wave of the conference series and all these events we're going to is we're going to start to see who has production workloads, who has meat on the bone when it comes to product and technology. And is it grounded in reality? Reality means value. <laughs> hit the singles if you need to. And if you can hit the swing for the fences, you got to be 100% sure that you can you'd hit that pitch. That means no hallucinations, complete observability, and no one has it. I mean, this just the reality is that no one has that in the enterprise. On the meta side, those guys are buying all the GPUs that sucking up all the action. Google, um, Amazon, Meta, Oracle, they're all sucking in all the hardware because they need the horsepower. And so it's going to be very interesting to see, Dave, what, what's going to go on. And again, if you're in the data business right now, you're a data engineer, you're going to have a job for the future. And well, we have interested to see how these the agent technologies move, take the chatbot, old chatbot market. Again, another old versus new chatbots. That well, new, ch new chatbots are intelligent agents. They're not, hello, how can I help you for customer support? A whole nother level. But to your point, you know, the, 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 the supposed safe bet is to sort of sit back and wait, you know, bubble gum shrimp maybe, but then that's not a safe bet because you get, you get blown away. Um, and then at the same time, you really ha you have to make bets, but it's risky making those bets. You make the wrong bet, you're going to get blown away. So to your point, if 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 I were going to bet, I would be bet on, betting on data. I would be betting on making data, data quality, data consistency, uh, data access, democratizing data. I I would be trying to put innovations around that and adding value around that. And then trying to find moats that, you know, protect my, my, my business. And it's a very hard thing to do right now because yeah. it's so unpredictable. Well, Dave, a lot of stuff going on on, a, on an upbeat note. Uh, things are rocking and rolling in the Valley, more meetups and AI than ever before. Um, some other Crazy. things, some other, some other breaking news. Jing Jing's is closing after 38 years. The famous Chinese place where many meetups happened, many events happened. Um, I was just texting with uh, Andy Kessler, um, my friend. We, we um, had lunch there one time when I raised capital. We just had lunch. And he, Let's, I'll invest. Um, we have our lunches there. But I've done many like meetups. Dave Weiner and the Web 2.0 crowd used to do tons of like 15 of us would sit down there during the early days of the of the web. Um, Jing Jing's is an institution. It's closing in Palo Alto. So that's kind of a bummer. Uh, the NYES event was great yesterday. And uh, 
um, the day before we had a great dinner, met all the top people on the capital market side. You've been to New York, met all the folks were out here, Dave. So good culture there. How is the you? How is crushing it? Uh, he, I'll see how the we invite to, the, he's, fight he's, to he's, the future. He's coming in the studio in 15 minutes. We're going to do something. So, you know, how he launches his show. First member of the Cube Collective going supernova with the media. So, how we shout out to Howie Shu, the our, our, our proud member, Cube Collective member. Check out his new show. It's very cool. So, all good on this end. Very strong, very strong week. I mean, it's, I mean, with so much more news that we haven't covered, the EU. We'll pick that up next week on our rant section. But Dave, a lot of action. Reddit let OpenAI start crawling their their index for intelligence. OpenAI's talking to publishers. We should get to them too, by the way. Check out our AI, the cubeai.com. If you haven't seen it yet, more more improvements there. Um, did you see, uh, just a quick aside, did you see Chris Mims' article in the Wall Street Journal today? What yeah. I got wrong in a decade of predicting the future of tech? Great article. Yeah, did really you see good. That? <laughs> you see that? Yeah. Disruption's overrated. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, not anymore. He's probably, he by saying it's, overrated now it's actually going to happen well exactly <laughs> i had the same reaction it's going to go the opposite way funny he i, I love the the, um, the susceptible to the bs number three with his point about kara swisher um he, he says kara swisher whose boomtown column carrie used to have a column on the wall street journal um she's she used to say instead of asking um, herself how they're lying to her the reporter because the people tend to hype their company up she asked how are they lying to themselves which, if you think about co-founders and founders, they have to lie to themselves to believe their mission. In some cases, when the, before it's in, it happens, in your mind, you got to believe it to be happening. So I find that interesting, and I find it a juxtaposition to how she's categorizing it, because they could believe it to themselves. It, are they lying to themselves, Dave, if they're pursuing their mission of an unknown outcome? Question. I don't know. I think that's... Not a bad thing. You have to say, "Hey, I'm going to make it." The parachute will open. Now, you got to believe. Does, if the parachute, does, hey, if you jump out of a plane, you got to believe that the parachute's all going to open. You got to believe. Know? You got to <laughs> believe. And if the parachute doesn't open, splat, you're dead. So, you know, I think I would change Carrie's quote to say, "Let me check out your parachute," not thinking they had to lie themselves. So, you know, Kara can be kind of skeptical, but she's she can smell the bullshit. Um, I thought that article was fun and the tech bubble one was interesting. Right. Um, and I, I'm not sure I agree with Chris on a lot of these things, but a lot of these reporters don't have a lot of product vision and they tend to overreact on things. Um, anyway. Oh, IBM thinks coming up, Dave next week, Dell tech world. What are we going to hear? We've been briefed. We got all the information. What do you think is going to happen? Well, so I, it's kind of the subject of my uh, breaking analysis. So I'll, I'll give you a little little teaser. I think, I think. Look at IBM. It's like we are all in on hybrid. Right? I mean, and that's, so what I'm going to be watching for, John, is how the how hybrid hybrid cloud is translating to hybrid AI. Remember, there was a big gap in in on prem and public cloud when cloud first came out, and the on prem guys were like, just took forever. To respond it took them like 10 years to get their act together uh and i don't think it's going to take that long with ai and i think because yeah. there's so much data on prem i think you're going to see that that gap close and yeah. and you were at you i think you bounced into red hat uh summit yeah. right yeah Which, i did Matt i think Hicks they're gonna doing a great job there i think i think um i think ibm has to build on that um they announced a bunch of stuff with rel they announced they announced a bunch of stuff with llms so I think they're gonna, and I, th I think they they announced something with uh, open sourcing uh, Granite at the show. So they're gonna build on that. Um, I think they gotta really take AI beyond experiments and really you know, talk platforms and can their consulting business. And it's a power law of gen AI. They gotta show some proof points there. And I think they've done a lot of M&A and they gotta show that Aptio and I don't know how much they're gonna talk about HashiCorp, but, but yeah. Turbonomic. Yeah how that's driving AI ops. And then a Dell tech world. I mean, look, we're in a new era for Dell. Dell, yeah. you know, the hot, Dell is the hot stock, right? When was the last time Dell was the hot stock? You know, Jensen's going to, I think, going to be there in person. Bill McDermott is speaking at Dell tech world. What's that all about? Um, 
And you know, the whole G NVIDIA Dell AI factory that's going to be on display. I love, really... I, I Dell, love the AI factory. They the factory is awesome. They well, just they, stole that, from that terminology from Jensen. It was I brilliant. Think, I don't, well, it's, it's not stealing it, but it's going to be on their stage. And so he well, gave no, it to him. They, he gave, they it, gave it to him. him. Right. Yeah, he let them have it. They go after it. They say, here, take it, go for it. That's like, and it's great marketing. Um, even though I was talking to a reporter today, he's like, what does that even mean? I'm like, it's, it just what means if, everything's going to be what, AI. What the mean, data AI, center becomes AI. AI-ified. That's what it means. So yeah. I like I mean, that. It's, it's, a, it's a generational shift. That's like saying PC versus mini computer, right? You know, hey, I got a mini computer. <laughs> it's like, okay, now, no, I want a PC. Uh, all, You're going to hear the whole end-to-end -end story. Uh, Charlie yeah. Cowis is one of the keynote speakers. So look, at Dell doesn't have a strong networking business relative to Cisco and yeah. HPE. So it's trying to change the game and stuff its networking inside of servers with NICs. Yeah. That's where Broadcom comes in. So it's sort of inter-networking yeah. on GPU clusters. To your point, that's yeah. kind of clever. You know, Ehab is going to be, you know, talking about that. Yeah. And then, you know, the ecosystem. You know, Dell's is just a massive go-to-market channel. Yeah. Dell's. And they got partners with everybody. Their stock so, was up huge too, by the way. Speaking of Dell, their stock was up huge. And also, Dave, think about, um, we just found out we're going to be at uh, Broadcom, now VMware Explorer. That the Broadcom owns VMware. The Cube will be there. Looks like the Cube's going to have a huge presence at Databricks. We'll have three days of programming there. So we're going to, we got a lot coming on in the next couple of months. Um, and of course, we're gearing up for AWS reInvent at the end of the year. Not sure what it's going to look like there now that they got the new regime change, um, uh, what will happen there because commitments are coming in soon. Um, and just overall, just good overall team dynamics and the market's looking good. I do want to say one thing, Dave. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I was kind of hammering uh, the analysts from the Apple stock. Um, and I was kind of went, 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 went on a rant about people claiming, oh, I would, I would never buy Apple. Yeah. Okay. Well, guess what? It's up 20, 13% since then. It's Tony up. Sakanagi is the best analyst out there. And, you know, <laughs> He was like, he was pretty positive on it. And uh, I would take his word, a true, yeah. Um, yeah. true, you know, analyst uh, on Wall Street, uh, yeah. of certified financial analyst. So, yeah. yeah so don't, listen, don't listen to any of the industry analysts on stock picks, <laughs> please. Please. All right, Dave, great to see you. We're going to, we're going to, I'll see you next week. We're going to see each other again at the events, uh, IBM Think and Dell Tech World, Informatica. Um, Check out siliconangle.com. And, and by the way, we've got some new analysts we're hiring. They're going to announce that next week as well. And again, thecube.net, thecuberesearch.com, siliconangle.com, thecubeai.com. That's our language model, the linguistics of the cube. Years of cube transcripts, all vectorized and indexed for retrieval. Check it out, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. See you, John. See you, everybody.